welcome to today's webinar, Managing PCB Design Complexity, Driving Design Success Without Driving Yourself Crazy. Again, my name is Sarah Wyckoff, and I will be your moderator for today. Before we get started, I'd like to address a few logistics and details on the GoToWebinar platform. If you are unable to hear the presenter or see the presentation at any time throughout the webinar, please let us know in the chat, and we will do our best to resolve any issues. Everyone's line is currently muted and will remain so for the duration of the webinar. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type them in the questions panel as they come up. We will have representatives ready to answer your questions directly during the webinar. With that being said, I want to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar and introduce you to our presenters, Ed Clark and Helen Label. Ed is a Senior Applications Engineer and Business Development Manager with EMA Design Automation. He has over 30 years of experience designing complex IC packages, SIPs, and PCB systems. Helen is a senior applications engineer that, dis that started her career working as a PCB designer in Silicon Valley in 1978. She has worked for companies such as Mentor Graphics, Cadence Design Systems, and Cooper and Cheyenne Technologies. She has been at EMA for eight years. Her primary focus is component and database management. Ed will start off the webinar with information on ma managing design complexity, followed by a brief demonstration done by Helen. Assuming we have time at the end, we will field some questions in a formal Q&A. Thank you for your attention, and now over to you, Ed. Thank you. Just wanted to say thank you, everyone, for attending today. You know, one of the things that we're going to talk about today is the d design complexity and how it's exploding, expanding uh, exponentially, and in some cases, <laughs> non-linearly. Um, you know, you, you really can't peel the stickers off the Rubik's Cube <laughs> like, like we did in the past. Uh, there are many, many more complexities other than line width and spacing uh, length rules that we had before in the past. Um, and these complexities are, are what we're going to be talking about today and how to manage those complexities because even with the most simple spacing length and, and line width rules, you can have thousands, tens of thousands even uh, rules. And then when we start to get into uh, some of the advanced rules, electrical rules, uh, manufacturing rules, uh, those, those just multiply. <laughs> Like I said, no, no, no peeling the stickers off. <laughs> uh, and what that kind of uh, translates into is, uh, you know, making sure that you you have those constraints uh, managed. You know, if you if you're not managing, you have reduced yields, reliability issues. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, Respins are are another uh, another big uh, factor that comes in. Uh, spending time in the lab. Uh, you know, trying to, to get things work. That's something that most design schedules really can't uh, can't afford. Uh, and then, of course, increasing manufacturing costs. Um, you know, your, your yield is going down because there are certain uh, rules that haven't been taken into consideration. Um, and just uh, overall, how to better get a better yield out of uh, out of the particular manufacturer's uh, process. And then the ripple uh, effect, where you have systems of systems that uh, you know now now you're holding up the the entire larger system, and uh, when that happens, then you miss time to market schedules and projects get canceled. It's it's uh, not a good thing. Um, so how do these affect uh, and impact your design? You know, here here's a you know just one example that I that we thought was was really poignant. Uh, you know, one differential pair uh, in this DDR interface can have 13 individual design rules associated with it. Uh, and those are just physical and, and uh, spacing constraints, which we'll get to later. Uh, so if we if we look at that, that's really, uh, you know, 13 times if there's 64 of those in, in a design, that's, you know, 832 <laughs> uh, design rules that you're, that you're having to manage. You can't manage those with with properties. This is just something that you know, as as those constraints and uh, being able to manage those that those uh, explode. There's just no way to uh, to manage that. Um, no one person can manage that. And um, this is what we're we're trying to uh, to manage. 
So how do we track these? You know, how do we make sure that we're uh, meeting the, the spec requirements? And you know, we want to make sure that you know all the different interface specs are are taken into consideration. Um, you know, you know, and you know, how do we do the final uh, verification validation? You know, once once we're all done with this. Uh, you know, here's a, a a really cool example. I think um, you know, with Nvidia, we'll de define the design rules up front, and to take it a step further, uh, a lot of these clients will uh, develop the design rules up front, create the topologies, evaluate, making sure that you know this reference design may have been for a full size you know motherboard now you're going down to something that's smaller you're changing the form factors so you need to do that um, solution space that uh, that that rules uh, define and uh, in development uh, up front so you know as you do that you you evaluate that as you go you're getting real-time feedback from the design system uh, as you move something, as you uh, slide etch around. You know, these are the kind of things that you, you really need to achieve first pass success. And you, know, you go through this uh, process where you implement, verify, and you know, the, the entire time, you'll kind of see a theme where we're, we're getting real-time feedback. We're getting heads up displays with uh, push and shove uh, during the routing, uh, tuning during the routing. Um, and uh, you know, real-time impedance feedback, those kind of things. Those are really, really necessary if we want the first pass design success. So where do the rules come from? <laughs> they come from all over the place, uh, and and that, those are some of the things that you know people struggle with uh, these days. You know, they they come from uh, you know the the design specs, you know the the DDR, the um, uh, PCI uh, Express, um, you know, multiple different chipsets will have their own rule sets from previous designs, um, you know, from the manufacturer. So now we're throwing in uh, manufacturing um, rules that we're going to have to take into, into consideration as well if we're going to be able to ever produce this, to assemble this, to test this, uh, and then throw in uh, into the equation, you know, Putting it into an assembly, you know, manuf uh, a, a mechanical assembly. So you have to have uh, the ability to do uh, step models and, and be able to pass that information uh, to the mechanical guys in a seamless, uh, seamless way. So all of that is, uh, you know, where the rules come from. Uh, the simulation, I, I didn't mention that, but you know, that's done uh, as part of rules development. Up front, those rules get developed. They get saved as you know something in a form that you can reuse later on. That's something that's really important too. If you're going to do all that, spend all that time doing rules development, you want to be able to to reuse that. Really important. So, just what are some of the rules? You know, and, and these are some of the basic rules, right? Everybody knows what physical rules are, right? You know, it's a line width. And that, you know things to do with uh, associated with that line width, but are they different uh, based on the layer that you're on? Sure, you know that's uh, you know that, that's part of it. Um, you know the impedances are going to change, you know, based on on the on the uh, layers the, and the uh, making sure that the impedance is. Uh, managed as, as we go through that as part of the electrical rules, but the physical rule. Width affects all of that down down the road. We can also have uh, different um, physical rules uh, for areas. So if we have regions that we want to, you know, ne neck down into this certain re area where we're doing a, um, you know, tr trying to break out of a, 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 a very high density uh, ball grid array, for instance. Um, and then again, you know, making sure that we have coupling for differential uh, differential signaling lines. All that is is included in there, and and all this needs to be maintained, you know, not in a not as a property that gets uh, moved around, but in, in a uh, in an environment in a um, uh, constraint management system that allows you to 
quickly and effectively uh, manage these complexities. Same, same goes with, with spacing rules. Spacing rules actually get even a, a layer deeper, no pun intended, um, but you can have certain classes, um, let's say a, a, a high, high voltage class, and those high voltage nets are gonna be you know, a different spacing away from the, uh, you know, the clock signals or the other digital signals and low voltage signals that are, that are in the design. So now you have the uh, uh, situation where you're going to have class to class uh, rules. So for spacing, so those uh, also would apply in regions, and uh, also inner layers are, are going to be uh, having different rules as as external layers. So you can see that the complexities are, you know, even if it's just line width in spacing. Every time that we add another net, we could potentially add, you know, another, you know, factor of uh, of constraints and, and something that we we're going to have to manage with this with this design. So, you know, just that being said, a lot of people will say, "Oh, I don't do electrical rules." Well, everybody does electrical rules, whether it's matched length, um, or whether they know it or not. You know, there's uh, current return paths. There are, you know, a, a lot of <laughs> electrical rules that uh, create or embody themselves as as physical and spacing rules later on. You know, when when we talked about spacing, you know, if two nets run together for for a very long time, you'll end up with with crosstalk. You know, if the if the net runs over a, a gap uh, in the power plane you now have an impedance discontinuity. So these are all things that are extremely critical uh, to look after, and you need this feedback real time as you design. You'll see uh, much uh, much more in detail as, as we go here and, and uh, you know, with, with differential pairs, relative propagation delays, and even some more complex uh, design. But um, you, know, you really need to focus on the circuit performance you know, as it as the signal travels across and through the board too, so we can have uh, three-dimensional constraints that you know take into consideration uh, the package, the die spacing, uh, the wire bond, you know, the package uh, delay that's associated with it, and that's that's critical, especially in some of the DDR constraints and and um, uh, standards that that we have today. Manufacturing rules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are, are one of the things that typically in the past everybody throws it over the wall. The, the folks at, at the uh, manufacturer will will look for the assembly rules. They'll move your your components around because there's no way that the solder would would work properly, uh, flow properly with with this bigger part being in front of the the smaller part. And then just you know physical as, acid trap, silk screen, silk screen, uh, solder uh, paste wicking maximum exposed solder edge, you know, uh, solder mask uh, edge. You know, there's uh, a ton of manufacturing rules and complexities that need to be managed as well. And those are all something that should be managed at the very same time that you're managing your physical, your spacing rules, your electrical rules. You want to have that all in one spot for uh, being able to manage and, and understand where these these complexities are and, and, and how they make an overall influence to the uh, to the design process. So as I mentioned before, some in, in, you know more advanced I won't say they're advanced uh, rule scenarios with regions. Everybody pretty much uh, does regions now to to break out uh, break out rules. Uh, in being able to do net scheduling, that that goes to um, goes to the uh, effect of you know creating a, a topology like you see in the the lower left hand corner there with with the X nets and uh, you know that's really important you know it's not just you know willy nilly let's uh, you know uh, you know have this signal go from from the uh, from the processor to the memory it has to go in a certain order you know it has to have a uh, series terminator that's a part of that, and the uh, delay or length from the uh, from the driver 
to that terminator to uh, the receivers is is all that needs to be managed. And you know this is a, an older example of DDR uh, technology where where they're sharing uh, banks. And you know DDR5 now uh, each bank has its own uh, device or own DIM, if you will. Um, so that's that's something that's uh, you know always on on the go, always changing. Uh, and then on the upper right here, we have the on-screen overlay, seeing uh, you know impedance discontinuities, seeing uh, coupling discontinuities. You know as you as you're in the design, as you're doing your work is really how you need to work. Um, and DQ10, they uh, are tightly coupled, you know, so they're green. Uh, when you have something that's not as, not as tightly coupled, uh, you know, you'd have a, a red, or, or you can specify whether you want it, uh, the coupling to be, okay, now you've got a certain level of millivolts of crosstalks that, that you know, that have been induced, and, and that can show up as a, as a, as a red, uh, red flag as well. So again, a couple other advanced formula-based. You can write your own rules. Uh, those are certain, certainly the case where if you're doing bleeding edge technology, you may want to do that, or you might want to write your own rule for a manufacturing enhancement that the, uh, uh, that, that the manufacturer says, well, hey, if you could check for this, you know, that would save us a lot of time and it would save you uh, a tremendous amount of yield, which would save you money. And then the other thing that you want to do is really avoid, uh, you know, being uh, a pessimist. Uh, you know, rules of thumb is something that, you know, they they you did, you know, many many years ago. I, we we had one decoupling capacitor per per chip on the on the board. We did that, you know, back in the day, and and uh, uh, you know we we really don't want to do that anymore. And having the capability where we're where we're impedance aware. We have integrated uh, field solvers that will uh, give you real-time feedback, you know, of your impedance in, in a, in a cl color grid that you can instantly identify, uh, you know, where the hot spots are, uh, where the issues are going to be uh, in the design, and all that happens real time and the way that you need to work. And like I said, putting it all together, you know, kind of building a, a complete picture of, of how the rules uh and get assigned how how they get uh managed you know if you, you you take a look at the the spreadsheet in the upper hand right here there's a, a, a just a, a quick view of the electrical rules that are in this design you know the uh, min max length uh static phase um tolerance so static and dynamic phase tolerance are just two different uh ways of tuning a differential pair uh, relative propagation delay is is another way where you know you'd want to have uh, you know the data line set up relative to the clock lines in a DDR circuit, for instance, or, or a control. Um, you know, all of those are are something that are are very important. Developing those constraints, being able to reuse those constraints, and see that real real time feedback there. The examples of of that later on. Uh, but you have uh, all the capabilities, you know, to, to define these rules from the start, uh, from the schematic even. Um, there is the same constraint management system in the, in the front end, in, in the schematic, as there is in the back end. But making, making sure that you have, you know, a constraint management system that allows you to manage these complexities as simple as they may be with your physical and spacing, your electrical um, and your manufacturing process is just invaluable. And what if is is another way of looking at the the constraint development? You know, you're basically doing the what ifs. What if I, you know, wanted to to make this product smaller? What if I wanted to, uh, you know, change the reference design that uh, that Intel or AMD provided me? You know, I'm using a different form factor. You know, could I manage those rules? Can I uh, push those rules? Um, can I see those rules? Can I evaluate those while I'm doing it or at any, uh, any stage of the design cycle? And, you know, those are, those are some things that are, are really important because not everything is, is ideal in, in a uh, environment.
would you be able to um, you know leverage those rules across other designs you know reuse those rules you know create your rules as your intellectual property and um, as I mentioned before you know do all this in, in real time as you design if you don't see it until after everything's placed and routed in, in too late you know it, it's 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 too late. You're going to have to push things around. The the other thing that you want to make sure too is that you know just because you can constrain something doesn't mean that you should constrain something. <laughs> you know that you know, over constraining is just as bad as 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 under constraining. So having that happy medium there, um, and you know having that constraint management, having that complexity management, if you will. And having the ability to see and fix those violations in real time, not batch like I was uh, like I was mentioning before, but real time. As you do the design, you, you're going to see the the issue that that's there, and you're going to fix it. You know that's going to streamline your design process. You're going to spend most of your time up front and eliminate multiple iterations. Of course, that's going to save you, you know, time. Uh, and time to market and uh, and you know in the long run money. So with that, I'll I'll switch over to uh, Helen. She's going to give you a, a a good overview. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you everybody for being here and thanks Ed. Um, that was really informative. And like Ed said, we you know there's just so much complexity to deal with these days. And so how do you handle that efficiently without going crazy? Like the title of this webinar. Um, there's so much that we could show you. We really wanted to kind of encapsulate it, give you an overview. And to that end, I'm only going to show you a few things that I think will be beneficial. And if you need to get dive deep beyond what I'm going to show you, what Ed has discussed, please feel free to contact us. We can set up, you know, um, individual demonstrations for you and your team, and we can really tailor it to whatever it is that you need to see. Uh, we're very happy to do that. Uh, but in consideration of our time here today, uh, uh, your time, I have uh, a few things that I'd like to focus on today and a few specific areas uh, with regard to setting up constraints and how those tasks can be simplified. So there's three areas that I'm going to show you. The first area is going to be uh, setting up DDR3 byte lanes and applying constraints to them in the schematic. Uh, the next area that I'd like to show you is setting up pin pairs in the schematic, applying constraints to them, and then I'm going to send those constraints to the board, to, a, to an associated board, and show how we can implement correct by design changes to the routing so that they all comply with the constraints that we've set up uh, in the schematic. Uh, and the third area that I'd like to show you is how we can leverage timing vision in a board, and I'll show you what that is. We'll talk about that when I get to it. That'll be my final piece um, that I'm going to demonstrate for you today. So we have a schematic open. I'm going to go ahead and launch my constraint designer in my schematic environment. And so this is really going to focus on what I have going on here uh, in this particular schematic. And, you know, there's so much, like we've been discussing, there's a lot of complexity, there's a lot of very comprehensive things that we can take into account here. Even with our constraint area here, there's a lot of rules that we can set. If I look over here quickly, I'm not going to go through all of these, obviously, but I am going to single out some of these that I think um, will be interesting to see for today. In addition to this, we could poke around in each one of these things, but in addition to this, we understand that there are certain things you really, really, really want to focus on, and and that gives us kind of an advantage because we can just focus on the things that are related to what we typically want to set up with DDRs and the same thing like with pin pairs. So these are our designers. I'm going to go dive into the DDR design. Now, the screen typically, this particular screen works with the idea that DDRs and other high speed uh, technologies, these usually require constraining, you know, large buses. Uh, but the buses are usually divided into byte lanes, and those byte lanes have to be routed together with very specific constraints in order to meet their electrical requirements. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate how we can set these up here. So I'm going to be going through some constraints 
I'm going to set up four bite lanes. So when I get these set up, then I can go ahead and uh, I can apply kind of global uh, rules to the bite lanes. And then I'll talk about some of the other things that we can do. Uh, but I've got my bite lane set up. And the next thing I want to do is I want to, I want to filter out my nets. There we go. All right, so, so quickly what I want to do is associate these to my bite lanes. And let's move down here. One of the nice things about these designer pages is that they really do allow you to just focus on the things that you're concerned with, you know, for whatever page we're looking at. In this case, DDRs. And so now I've got everything associated. So now I can go ahead and I can start applying some of the constraints that I'm concerned with. And I'll be doing, uh, let's do these uh, just basics uh, overview. So bite lanes, so bite lanes to itself. What's the line to line spacing, line to through pins, line to SMD, line to VIA. So let's go ahead and set these up. I'm gonna make these all the same. And then we'll dive into some other, <clears throat> other constraints. So I'm going to keep these at 12 mils, the same thing, bite lanes to the rest of the board, uh, 12 mils. You know, and this is just a sample, obviously. You might have different constraints that you want to apply, but you can see how we can go ahead and uh, input these uh, pretty quickly, actually. Uh, so now I'm on my layer. So what I want to be able to do is set up my scheduling. And I'm going through these to show you the kinds of things that we can do and actually the ease with which I can do these. Uh, so for my layers, I want to be I want to be able to set these up and schedule these a certain way. Let's say I want to do these as source load daisy chains. Let's also say I want to have these route on specific layers. So my first byte lane will route uh, on L3. Let's route this one on L5. Once again, L3. And I'm going to put this final one on L5. Okay. Also, I have made, I might have a specific via that I can use. Now, these these have been set up, and they might, you know, vias. You can have as many vias as you need. Maybe they have different sizes. They go to different layers. They're just different, you know, different configurations. Um, and so you'll have access to these. So I'm going to apply a specific via here, and then I also want to determine how many vias. Um, so that was that was something that I could apply to all my bite lanes with regard to my layers. Uh, the next thing I can do is move over to my uh, line widths, and I can apply specific line widths for routing uh, for each one of my layers. And typically, typically my top and bottom are different, you know, than the internal. So I'm going to make these, and let's make my internals six mils, and so I can apply my minimum line width for each one of my bite lanes when they route on those particular layers. The next thing I want to look at is my impedance. I'm going to keep these at 50 ohms with a 10 oops, 10 percent tolerance. Okay, so that's my impedance. The next thing I might be considered considering uh, implementing is is to do with my propagation delay. So with my propagation delay, I can set up, you know, how are these pin pairs are going to behave. And I want these to behave as a long short. Uh, maximum prop, de prop delay I'm going to add as one mil. And that's what I'm going to do for my propagation delay. Now, as I go through, I'm kind of going through these pretty quickly without tons of explanation. But I want to be able to populate this eventually back into my spreadsheet. And you'll be able to see how those uh, can pretty quickly en uh, end up there. So let's move into my relative prop delay. I do also want to show you diff pairs too. So once again, my pin pairs, I'm going to set these up as long short. My delta zero and my tolerance is going to be 10 mils. Okay, so that's uh, all of these that I have done so far. Set up my bite lanes, I identified those. Now what I want to do is set up my diff pairs and I can go ahead and do that, but I think it's easier if I go ahead and show my diff pairs and so now I can go ahead and see which ones I want to associate with uh, those uh, those bite lanes. So let's go ahead and do that now.
and then I can start to apply constraints to my div pairs as well. And one more. Okay. With my div pairs, I want to apply a minimum line width. So I'm going to grab all of these. Once again, my uh, outer layers are going to be slightly different. So we'll make uh, top and bottom 12 mils and my internals 5 mils. And I'll apply those. There's quite a number of things here that we could do. I'm just going to do a few more of these. Um, gather control. I'm actually going to ignore that for now. My uncoupled maximum is going to be 200 mils. So that means it's uncoupled. That's the that's the maximum amount that these diff pairs can travel uncoupled or, or apart before they run into a violation or a violation will show up. So uh, my static phase tolerance is going to be 5 mils. My dynamic phase max is also 5 mils. I'm going to make these 10 mils for my dynamic phase tolerance. And once again, I want to use my VIA. And so I've kind of gone through this pretty quickly, but you can see the, the, the point, really one of the, one of the mo main focus areas is that I wanted to show you how when you do have a DDR, uh, DDR setup that you need to do, this is a very highly focused area that you can get through these pretty quickly and really apply these to the nets that, uh, you know, that are part of this uh, DDR uh, bus. And so that's actually what I did. Uh, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and run my DDR setup. And I'll say done. So this is going to populate my views here. Let me expand this a little bit. So if I came in to say like my electrical relative prop delay, we can see some of the things that I've set here, long, short, uh, my delta and my tolerance, uh, differential pairs. We can see the, uh, the constraints that I set up inside of uh, here and also, you know, min max prop delay. So we could really examine these, but I wanted you to see um, how, how we can go ahead and implement these at this level. Now, why is this important? Because couple of reasons. If you're an engineer and you're doing this work inside of your schematic, it's it's really super valuable if you can input this at the schematic level, because now that I have this in here, I can go ahead and import this or export this to a board that's that's relative to this. And so I can push all these changes very quickly over. So that's going to do a couple of things. It's going to all you only have to put your changes in once or your constraints in once. You don't have to do a write up you know, like um, Ed had mentioned in his presentation, how do you get this stuff over to the layout? Well, this is going to be a, you know, a significant time saver. It's accurate. You can always refer back to it. If you need to make a change, you can make a change and export that right over to the board. Likewise, if I have changes on the board, you know, that needed to be made, I can pull those back over. So everything's going to be collaborative. This is a very collaborative environment going back and forth. Um, and so, so this is what I wanted to show you for the uh, DDR section. And next I want to, so I want to show you pin pairs. And once again, this is really a focused area. Um, there's more, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's more than just DDRs and pin pairs, uh, but really these are just two areas that I've chosen to work with today. And we're going to be working with this VD bus. So once again, I'm going to dive into my pin pairs, um, and I can go ahead and select my nets that will apply. And that's going to be my VD bus. And we'll just make those nets what we want to work with for our pin pairs. Um, with the pin pairs, and uh, I have a little bit of space and time of one of the things that I'm going to run in a little bit. We could talk more about what they actually are, but for now, I just want to get these organized. Uh, so I'm going to move my component uh, R9 down a little bit so that I can accurately get my uh, pin pair set up here. Uh, so I've got my components and I've got my uh, resistors. That's really all I need to do. If I say assign these, they're assigned. Uh, so now I've got all of my pin pairs established uh, pretty pretty darn quickly. Uh, so now what I can say is okay. So the next thing that I would want to do is um, 
I actually want to apply some constraints now that I've got this going on. Uh, oh, let me collapse these so we can just focus on our VD bus here. And here we are. So now we can see the pin pairs as they as they have been uh, identified. So the next thing that I might want to do is apply delay to these. And I could go ahead and import enter these manually. In fact, I could come down and let's see where there my VD bus is. HK, it's right here. So I could enter these manually. I mean, and I could have a whole bunch of things going on in here. Uh, but I also could import this data from a text file, which is what I'm going to do, just to kind of show you that we can do this. It goes to my delay text that I have been using, so it knows where to go for that. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and import that. Import it. I'm going to write this. And then let's make sure that that got in here. There we are. So we can see what these pin delays um, have been entered as. I'm going to save these and done. And now if I come in here, uh, now I can see what the delay is that has been uh, has been added to these. But I'm I'm not quite done. I want to add a couple more things. I want to add prop delay, and then we're going to go take a look at this on the board. Um, so what I'm going to do is let's grab all of these. And I'll make that 750 mils. This is going to be 3,000 mils. We'll be able to see this in the DRCs when it comes up. DRC stands for Design Rule Check. Oops, 3,000. And so just a few more here. Uh, 750 mils and 3,000. If you're an engineer and you're curious about putting these changes in up front, it doesn't really take much. You don't have to be, <laughs> you don't have to be an expert at doing this and entering the the values into these spreadsheets. These spreadsheets are designed that you can actually, you know, come in here and see, you know, exactly what it is you want. Go ahead and enter these pretty quickly. And so, uh, so we can see I've got all these in here now for my VD bus. And what I can do at this point in time, just like I would have done for the DDR, but I didn't. Uh, this we do want to see this in a board, so I am going to go ahead and push this to the board. I'm just going to say update my board, go out and pick which one I want to use, and we'll choose this guy. Yes, because I've been working with it, that's why I'm going to overwrite it. So, so like I said, if I had other changes in here and I had already been working with this, it would still populate that information to my board. It will tell me when it's done exporting the data to my board. It has been written. So now I can come over to my board. Let's choose my board. And this is uh, this is what we've got going on. So these are actually my pin pairs. Here's R9. Uh, this is, if we look, here's my VD bus. Um, now, if we look at my DRCs, by the way, if you're not familiar with these DRCs, if I get close to it, there's a little E and a D. That stands for electrical delay. And if you look at the little flyout message, it tells me what it is. It's propagation delay, the 750 mils to 3,000 mils, and it tells me what the actual value is. Therefore, it is in error currently. And so these are the things that I want to try and fix. So the other way that I can look at these is if I open up my constraint manager, I can also see these are my VD bus. I can see uh, I can see, you know, what the constraints are. Now, anything that's in red, actually, if I go ahead and analyze these, it will, it pushes, uh, it, it gives me more data. But what I can see is when there's lots of red, that tells me that there is a problem. Okay, so, uh, so what I'm going to do is I want to fix these. Now, bear with me for a sec while I organize this because I want you to see in real time how this is going to be changed um, as I'm as I'm routing. Um, so I'm going to draw your attention to a couple of areas here. While I'm actually fixing this routing, uh, I'm going to draw your attention to the constraint manager because this is going to change. This red is going to change while I'm making this correct by design. And also in the lower right hand area is a ruler that comes up and measures the the length of trace that I have. And it tells me when I'm within or not within my uh, constraint that I'm trying to meet. So uh, so let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna, let's put in a trombone here. So this is my delay. 
So if I start drawing, if you look in the lower right hand corner, you should be able to see that that ruler. Now watch when I start drawing. As soon as I get within range, it'll turn green and it tells me that yes, I'm within range and that's correct. So I'm going to go ahead and accept that one. You'll be able to see some of these changing as well. Let's change to an accordions. So same thing here. I'm now within range. Let's do this one. Oh, there we go. So now, you know, and you can just keep right on going down the line here. And you can see, hopefully you saw these changed as I went, as I, as I uh, continued along here. So this is what I wanted to show you for uh, implementing the pin pairs in the schematic, pushing this data over to the board and doing correct by design or real live changes to where I can accurately see, you know, what's my progress here and am I meeting the constraints as I go. So that was the uh, second area that I wanted to show you. Now what I'm going to do is, let's maximize my screen, let's go to another design. I want to show you the timing vision and I've got about a third of a really large bus here. Uh, I'm only going to use a third of it because I want to be able to show you on screen what this is like. Um, so I'm going to show you something called timing vision. And timing vision is going to give us kind of an inside, insight into this, this area or the area that I choose to see if it satisfies my required timing. Let me go ahead and select this bus. And so if I zoom in here, I do have DRCs on here. They are delay problems. But if we look at this compared to our timing vision area, green tells me that the satisf it satisfies required timing. Um, red indicates that it's shorter than the required value because this is my target net we're all trying to match, uh, match these. So these are gonna be, we're gonna create delays that will match to this uh, target net eventually. Um, so you can kind of organize this if I wanted to see, you know, which nets are a smaller amount, shorter, or longer than required. You can play with these colors and adjust it to your own uh, preferences. But this is really what we want to do. If I call up my constraint manager once again, uh, let's expand my routing. And let's look at relative prop delay. And this is my AD my AD group, and you can see there's a lot going on here uh, with that is incorrect. Uh, so once again, I'm going to push this over to the side here, and let's go back and focus on this. Um, and, and by the way, if I wanted to, I could really come into my constraint manager, and I could analyze these, and it will expand these a little bit so I can see now this is my target net. So let's create match delays that will map to this and uh, be become corrected. So in order to do that, the next phase that I wanted to show you here is I want to grab these nets. And we're going to go to auto interactive delay tuning. What's nice about the auto interactive delay tuning is that I know I have all these nets that need to be match delay. If I'm the layout designer and I'm going to sit here doing these, it's you know it's going to take me a significant amount of time to get all of these done to fit into the area that I want, um, you know, and to have these uh, correct. So the auto interactive delay can can uh, be very selective with certain areas, and it can go uh, be applied and pretty quickly. I would say within about a minute. I don't know if we're timing it or not, but. Within about a minute, we can go ahead and get these um, within the delay constraints that we wanted them to be. And there we go. So they're all green, but uh, that's because I'm still in the uh, timing vision mode, so they're all green. But if you if you were to, like I said, you know, try to uh, try to enter these by hand, this you know, be pretty significant chunk of time there while you're working on these, and you still have to go back and check them and make sure that they're correct. Uh, if I bring up my constraint manager, these are all correct now. So, uh, so in a really, you know, minimal amount of time, I was able to come in here and check these lines, uh, use my auto interactive delay, and go ahead and run those. Make sure that they're, you know, uh, make sure that they're correct now, and also compare them in my spreadsheet. 
Um, so that's what I wanted to show you today. I really started with the DDR constraints, entering those into the schematic um, constraint area. Next, I went into pin pairs and I showed you how we can uh, implement those as well as make correct by design changes in a board. And finally, I wanted to show you the timing vision with the auto interactive delay tuning. And so that said, I'm going to turn it back over to Ed. And I think Ed has a couple things he wants to uh, just say and wrap up. And thank you all for your time. So I'm going to turn this back over to Ed. OK, great. So th thank you so much, Helen. That was awesome. In fact, the, uh, the constraint uh, development and doing that stuff in real time and showing the feedback was amazing. So you, you got to see you know, the, the entire process from you know, taking a constraint you know, from Intel or one of the other specs and, and it putting it into the system and getting real-time feedback straight away. You know, just to, to kind of reiterate, you know, this, this constraint solution is, is integrated uh, both on the front end and the back end. You saw uh, Helen, you know, create the constraints on the front end, send them to the back end, get the real-time feedback from the, uh, from the constraint manager, you know, as, as you were doing the design, you know, and, and doing the tuning. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of value there. Uh, just having one constraint management system, one uh, GUI. Uh, these are some of the, the new technologies that are there uh, in, inside, of, uh, inside of the tools that allow you to do the in-design analysis, the real-time feedback. Here's uh, real-time impedance feedback. And guess what? You don't need signal integrity models to do this. You know, there are embedded field solvers that are giving you the ability to, to see, the, uh, uh, see the changes in impedances, you know, real time. Uh, how about that? I mean, the, the, uh, <laughs> the setup is, is, is almost zero, and the feedback is absolutely fantastic. You can do it on, you know, part of the design, or you could do it on the, the entire design. The same thing goes with coupling. You know, what, what is coupling? You know, like, like we had mentioned before, a lot of people will just do parallelism. Well, with the embedded... Uh, field solvers that we have now, this, this identifies uh, the potential uh, and simulated um, coupling that's going to occur because the traces are, are running parallel for, for too long of a, a length. Um, and that can be from the same layer or it could be from uh, adjacent layers. So you can do that in, in 3D, real-time feedback, just like you saw with, uh, with Helen's uh, version. Um, and you also have a version of uh, uh, that's called route version, where you know you can very quickly identify uh, manufacturing issues. Uh, you know straight away. You know if you if you fix these manufacturing issues, you won't see these issues when when you go to manufacturing. And as uh, Helen also showed, the timing vision environment, being able to you know, uh, use that embedded timing engine and do smart delay and phase tuning. Uh, the phase tuning was, was very quick. Uh, you know, in, in this uh, point, you have red, yellow, and green. So the yellow ones are, are close. Um, you know, in this case, short, there's, there's uh, two different ways to, to display these in, inside of the constraint manager, yellow being close or, or within a certain tolerance green being good and red being uh, out of tolerance. So in this, in this case, green's good, red short, and yellow's long. So uh, a lot of uh, capabilities in there. But again, real-time uh, feedback as you, uh, as you do the design. And then you also have the interactive technologies that Helen showed, the auto interactive delay tuning. There's also auto interactive phase tuning. Uh, this was the uh, topology development that we were talking about earlier. So whether you're in the schematic or whether you're in the layout, you're able to do that those those constraint uh, development, you, that topology development. You know these are rules that you can now save, reuse, apply to a 64-bit bus. You know, and while you're at it, why not run a simulation to see? you know, what, what the uh, effects are going to be. This does require you to have an, uh, an IBIS model to run the simulation, but you have, you know, lossy frequency dependent transmission lines that you can get directly from the schematic and or from the layout. So once it's placed and routed, 
you, you run another simulation, uh, an extraction of the routed interconnect to do a, a verification that everything is going to work just like it would work in the lab. So all that is you know, very well integrated into this constraint management system. This was another example of the spacing rules. Uh, and again, um, you know, some of the, the propagation rules that, uh, that Helen showed earlier. But like I mentioned, um, you know, as part of these topologies, you, know, you can set up impedance rules, you can set up propagation delay, relative propagation delay, you know, wiring, you know, the, basically the full gamut of, of, of constraints and save that off in a, in a topology file for, for, for later use in an in application. So, you know, with, with that uh, being said, um, just wanted to say uh, thank you all uh, very much. All right, thank you, Ed and Helen. This is Sarah again. And at this time, I would like to open up the floor for a Q&A. Please enter any questions you have in the, cha the chat now. If we're unable to address your questions immediately, we'll be in contact with you. Okay, first question. Can you also track constraints in time as well as length? Absolutely. So we can, you know, since we have a very intelligent uh, stack up, you know, we, we know the uh, propagation velocities, we have the lost uh, tangents associated with the with the material, so we can we can specify it is length and or you know time. All right, is it possible to reuse constraints between designs? Absolutely. One 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 of the areas that I I forgot to mention is how easy it is to to save a technology file. So the technology file will actually save the board stack up, all of the constraints um, and, and everything. So you could you could use the technology file as one means of, of reusing that information. The second way of reusing the information is the actual topology file that uh, that you see on the screen uh, at the moment, and those can be saved off as you know uh, uh, DDR uh, control or DDR data, and they can be both single-ended in and uh, differential pairs. Is it possible to create custom rules? Uh, absolutely. Um, there's there are the ways of of writing your own custom scripts. There's another uh, rule language uh, called Ravel that you could do advanced rules, um, Boolean operations. Um, or even uh, custom formulas inside of the uh, constraint management system. So if if there's a way to <laughs> that uh, a rule that or a constraint that you would like to define, we can figure out how to do it. Is the power integrity analysis also integrated in constraint management system, or is it only the signal integrity? Good question. So both of both of those are integrated into the system, uh, both power and uh, uh, signal integrity, um, and we can actually take that a level further, where we have, as part of the electrical constraints, uh, current return paths. Uh, you can get voltage drops, or you know IR drop, or you can also do AC and DC uh, uh, power integrity simulations. Can you define the constraints at the layout level and then push it back to the schematic rather than schematic driven? Yes. Yes, we can define the constraints since the constraint management system is the same. You just have to enable uh, that that the that you can back annotate constraints from from the back end to the front end. Uh, most of the times, the way that people will use the system is you have an electrical engineer, and an electrical engineer is going to do the schematic, and those those are going to you know take precedence. Um, but you can certainly um, back annotate that. You just have to check a box that says allow allow back annotation, um, and that will synchronize everything. Okay, thank you both. Looks like we still have some questions coming in, but we're out of time for today. 
However, if anyone has questions that were not addressed during the webinar, we will be following up with you on an individual basis. I will be closing the webinar now, and we will be sending everyone a recorded version of today's webinar with the slide deck within the next few days. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Thank you, everyone.